Welcome to Blind Abilities. Meet Laura Hernandez. I really enjoy comedy and making people laugh and spreading that type of medicine. I see it as like healing medicine to make people laugh. A comedian. I do a lot of like storytelling. A lot of it is through a blind person's experience. I'm completely blind in my right eye and in my left eye, I have some partial light perception. It's funny because sometimes I feel like people are like afraid to laugh. And I tell them like, this is the only time where it's like, okay for you to laugh at me. It's like, don't try to laugh at me when I'm trying to cross the street after the show. You know, like laugh at me right now when it's okay when I want you to laugh. <laughs> a poet with a passion for the spoken word. I started writing poetry when I was a teenager, pretty much to cope. I had a lot of health issues. I still do. So writing poetry was just a way to cope with that. And passionate about other causes. I have been a social justice advocate since I was like 17. <laughs> like right when I went to college was the first thing I wanted to do. So I became involved with a lot of community organizers in our city. And so I just started to advocate for different issues. Social justice kind of like the umbrella term for it. Highly educated. Finally getting into college, I just loved it. I knew that I was going to be surrounded by people who had more open minds. So I got my two associate's degrees, one in history and one in human services. And I went towards getting my bachelor's in sociology. I decided to also get a certificate in gerontology, which is the study of aging. Facing setbacks. I started the master's program in 2012. I had health issues come up, so I had to take a medical leave of absence. That was it. I decided to leave the program. With a pragmatic perspective. I don't know. I felt like there was some force trying to stop me from getting this degree. And I think the reason is that I might have just reached my end in the world of academia. Maybe this is time for me to focus more on the community, on comedy, and other things that really bring me joy besides just doing things that I feel like I have to do. A perspective gained over a lifetime of struggles. Marfan syndrome is a rare genetic disorder that affects the body's connective tissue. It affects my entire body. It's very difficult because sometimes doctors are treating one specific issue that I have and then it will just agitate or make another issue pop up. Blind Abilities presents a chat with Laura Hernandez. Join Jeff Thompson as he sits down with Laura, a blind comedian, a poet, with a truly unique perspective on life. Welcome to Blind Abilities. I'm Jeff Thompson. And today we're talking to a comedian, a college graduate, a certificate holder in gerontology. She has a whole list of stuff, but mostly she's chasing her passions and filling her goals and happiness in what she's doing. We're talking to Laura Hernandez. How are you doing? Hi, Jeff. I'm doing very well. I want to thank you for coming on the Blind Abilities and being willing to share your journey and your stories about your disabilities and the Marfan syndrome that you have been challenged with. Let's Let's start out with comedy. You're a stand-up comedian. Yes, I'm a stand-up comedian. I've been doing comedy a little over a year now, and it's been a really great experience. I really enjoy comedy and the whole process of writing jokes and the delivery and making people laugh and spreading that type of medicine. I see it as like healing medicine to make people laugh. Ah, Kind of a doctor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a funny doctor. <laughs> there you go. So far, it's been great. I've had a lot of wonderful opportunities come up and gotten to perform at a lot of different comedy clubs, and it's been really good. So I know a lot of you haven't seen me before. Me neither. So, I don't know what's going on here. But thank you. Yeah, so um, I'm six feet tall, y'all. Yeah. I said y'all. <laughs> I feel like sometimes when I say y'all, people wonder, like, am I from the South? And I am. Uh, my parents, they're from Mexicali. So, uh, how I got started actually was I went on another friend's podcast. You might know her. She's another Minnesotan. <laughs> her name's Andy Erickson. She was on Last Comic Standing. Oh, really? Yeah. She was one of the finalists. She didn't win, but she was like, I think, top three. Oh, wow. That's cool. Yeah. So, she also has Marfan syndrome. That's a syndrome that I also have. I was born with it, diagnosed officially at four years old. And so, we met because I had had seen her on there and I was like oh man I really need to connect with her so I connected with her and she has her own podcast called Deal With It 
everyone, and welcome to Deal With It Podcast. My name is Andy Erickson, and I'm here with my co-host, Jolene Lunzer. Yay! I have Marfan Syndrome. If you listen to the podcast, maybe you already know that. But if not, I have a heart condition called mm-hmm. Marfan Syndrome. It's a connective tissue disorder. We deal with health conditions, spreading awareness, and fighting stigmas. Yes, we want people to be comfortable with talking about what they have, what they're dealing with. So we're here with another Hernandez, Laura Hernandez. Yeah, Say your name good. for everyone. La- Laura. Laura. Oh, I love yeah, it. It sounds good. so fancy. <laughs> it's Spanish it's really Laura. Fancy. <laughs> <laughs> Beautiful. Everything sounds so much better. In Spanish? Yes. Don't <laughs> you think? Everything. Well, I don't know. I could be kind of biased, I guess. Maybe, maybe. <laughs> so I'm here with um, Laura Hernandez. We are basically yeah. heart sisters. We have the same yeah. heart condition. We connected on Facebook. Uh-huh. Was it after you saw me on Last Comic Standing, or um, was it? Yes, it was. Actually, Yay. my partner, Frank, was the one that told me about you on uh, uh. Last Comic. And I was like, oh, and then I saw you, and I was like, that's awesome. <gasps> and I reached out to you. And Yay. I'll have people come on with different issues that they're dealing with, disabilities or mental health issues, talking about how to cope oh that's cool i like that name. yeah deal with it yeah deal with it <laughs> yeah i talked with her on on her podcast and we had both talked about another comic who also has morphine syndrome his name is isaac martinez so i had wrote to him just to say hello you know just to connect he at the time was going to be putting on a show a fundraiser show for the National Morphon Foundation. It was going to be at the Ice House Comedy Club in Pasadena, California. So that was my first show. That was my first like official show where I had to write a full set. I didn't let anybody know that it was my first one. I kind of kept a secret. Most people thought that I had already performed. And so when I did it, I was very nervous, but I got through it. I don't think anybody noticed until afterwards. And then people were like, whoa, that was your first time. (laughs) Yeah, so it kind of fooled everybody. (laughs) So what kind of topics do you do for your comedy? Do you have a niche? I do. I do a lot of like storytelling and a lot of it is about like through a blind person's experience. I'm completely blind in my right eye and in my left eye, I have some partial light perception. So a lot of my comedy is about how I experience things. And it's funny because sometimes I feel like people are like afraid to laugh. And I tell them like, this is the only time where it's like, okay, for you to laugh at me right now. (laughs) The only time. Yeah, exactly. Like, don't try to laugh at me when I'm trying to cross the street after the show you know like laugh at me right now when it's okay when i want you to laugh (laughs) so what's it like preparing for your comedy stuff do you do it in braille do you do it by audio do you practice a lot I do it by audio. I do it on my phone. I do know Braille, but it just kind of takes longer for me to do it in Braille. I'm lucky enough to have an iPhone and I just use that for all my material. And then I'll just rehearse it in my mind. Just rehearse it, rehearse it. Because I have to have it memorized. I know a couple of other comics that sometimes like they'll write things on their hands and stuff you know when they're up there and i'm like okay well i i can't do that i have to memorize it <laughs> but yeah i mean it's pretty good i really am thankful for like technology on this phone because it's helped out a lot but yeah i want to take it back to my height because i feel like that's something most of y'all can see you know you you're also a spoken word artist slash poet yes yeah. and there's a lot of pressure with being a bigger person all the time you know, I, I constantly get people who look up to me, so I don't like, I don't take that responsibility too lightly. I don't. So sometimes, you know, people ask me, they're like, Laura, how do you handle ableism? And I have to respond by saying, I don't know. I'm not able to. So do you write your own poetry then? I do. I use the name. It's called Ojos del Alma, which is Spanish for eyes of the soul. And so that's my spoken word poet name i started writing poetry when i was a teenager pretty much to cope i had a lot of health issues i still do but during my teenage years i definitely had a lot of surgeries a lot of first things that i had to go through so writing poetry was just a way to cope with that i started doing spoken word and then it evolved into comedy oh wow so where can people find your poetry or do you have a blog are you on the web i don't have a blog some of my work is published online but it's kind of just scattered around i am planning on coming 
coming out with a zine, like mm-hmm. a poetry zine, but I have to collaborate with a couple of other people that will help me be able to get that out because it is pretty visual. And then I would like to also make it accessible because most zines are very like, you know, grassroots as people independently publishing. I want to do that, but also make sure that I have it accessible for other formats for people to read it. There you go. Yeah, trying to do that. <laughs> as far as my performances and stuff, I do have some of them on YouTube. I have a YouTube channel just under Laura Hernandez. And then I have my other social media handles so if anybody wants to know like when i have an upcoming show i'll usually post it on facebook or instagram and go from there i also read up on you social justice advocate can you explain that my sexuality like my eyesight used to be considered bi but now it's more like mono (laughs) mono visual mono mono Yeah, so I have been a social justice advocate since I was like 17. (laughs) Like right when I went to college was the first thing I wanted to do. I'm from San Bernardino, California. So I became involved with a lot of community organizers in our city. And so I just started to advocate for different issues. Social justice is kind of like the umbrella term for it. But I do a lot of work within the LGBTQ community, a lot of disability rights, and a lot of indigenous rights advocacy that I do. I'm involved with several organizations like the American Indian Movement. We have a local organization called Chica, which is an acronym for, it's really long. (laughs) It's Chicano Indigenous Community for Culturally Conscious Advocacy and Action. And so we just use Chica for short because it's very long. (laughs) Tough to get that on one (laughs) t-shirt. Right? (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) So we used to just say chica, but then we had to elaborate because sometimes people think we're just talking about a person. And I'm like, no, chica means this long acronym that we're not saying. (laughs) You've been blind since birth and, you know, you've had some retinal detachments. You just mentioned that you still have a little bit of light perception, but you're also living with Marfan syndrome. Can you tell our listeners what that is? Yeah, Marfan syndrome is a rare genetic disorder that affects the body's connective tissue. It affects my entire body. My syndrome was a spontaneous mutation. So I'm the first one in my family's history to have this syndrome. It affects a lot of different issues, a lot of ocular issues, cardiovascular, respiratory, our joints pretty much everything in our body. It's hard sometimes. There's a lot of rarities as side effects that come up and it's hard to live with. I know when I was younger, I embraced it right away because, well, I I pretty much didn't have any other choice. I just also kind of saw it as like, cool, like I kind of always knew I was different and this kind of medically proves that I'm different. (laughs) I really try to hold like a positive perspective. Around my teen years, I just started to have a lot of depression because it does impair you from doing a lot of things. And I felt like it was just one thing after the other. Like not only was my vision very bad, then I would have heart issues. And then I had respiratory issues. It felt like it was never ending. And thankfully, you know, I'm still living. I have had some very close encounters. A couple years back, I had a random like blood infection because our immune systems are very low. And so I had to be hospitalized. And then due to that hospitalization, I ended up having a heart attack. I had three of my coronary arteries clogged with blood due to the blood infection that they were just like kind of pumping me with antibiotics. It's very difficult because sometimes, you know, doctors are treating one specific issue that I have and then it will just agitate or make another issue pop up. Doctors are becoming more informed now about Marfan syndrome. And I'm thankful for that. A lot more people are coming out, becoming diagnosed. And there's a couple of celebrities actually that have come out that have it. So it's becoming more known. But for a while back, it it was very hard because whenever I'd go to the doctors, sometimes my own cardiologists, like they they didn't even know about it. So that they might have read about it during medical school, but they've never actually treated anybody. And I live in a region kind of like about maybe an hour and 40 minutes away from Los Angeles. So 
I have some doctors here that are more familiar with the syndrome, but there's still a lot of medical professionals that don't know what Marfan syndrome is. And it's kind of nerve wracking when I go into the doctor and I have to educate them on the syndrome that I have. <laughs> oh, I bet. You're not only a social advocate, but you're actually a medical advocate with the Marfan syndrome, the challenges of sight loss and everything. But you still made it through California State University, San Bernardino, with a bachelor's in sociology and a certificate in gerontology. That's quite the accomplishment. Yeah, I loved school. I always loved school. I think the worst part of school for me was dealing with other kids <laughs> and all the bullying and all that. So I knew that. Really? I had to get through middle school and high school to get to college. If I could just fast forward from elementary to college, I would have. That was the worst part. Yeah. Wow. Middle school was the worst. But finally getting into college, I just loved it. I knew that I was going to be surrounded by people who had more open minds and interested in real issues in the world. So I got my two associate's degrees, one in history and one in human services. And then after that, I actually took a little break before transferring and I went to do an independent living school for the blind in Los Angeles. It's called the Davidson's Program for Independence. And I went to go do that program. I didn't finish it. I love the program. It was great. But I felt like I had already learned a lot of the skills that they were teaching. And I didn't want to take up a space that I know someone else could really get a lot of good use out of it. Mm -hmm. I absolutely love the program. I think they do very well in helping to teach independent living skills. But I had just kind of already gone there with that experience. I left early. I didn't end up finishing the program. So when I came back to San Bernardino, that's when I went to Cal State San Bernardino. And I went towards getting my bachelor's in sociology. Because I'm always such a busy bee at school, I decided to also get a certificate in gerontology, which is the study of aging. That was my special specialty. I loved working with the older adult community, specifically people with dementia and Alzheimer's. Now, gerontology, it's more of an eclectic approach to looking at aging, isn't it? It is. It's kind of like a generalist framework. You get to learn different aspects that affect the aging process. You can learn from child development all the way up to health in later years, as well as grieving, counseling, all these different issues that I found so interesting. So I really wanted to go towards that. And the university offered a certificate program. So I decided to do that as well. Does it also go into some of the government policies on aging? It does. I thought that was interesting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It could be used as an advocacy platform in order to do like policy change. And so that kind of got me interested in going into graduate school to get my master's in social work. I wanted to do more. And I knew that as a person with a disability, I have to sometimes do more in order to be at an equal setting with other able-bodied people. So I decided to go into graduate school and that turned out to be a whole nother can of worms. <laughs> I was just on a podcast with Dr. Amy Kavanaugh. She said I used the word disability, and she said in England, they don't use that word. That's like a no-no word. Yeah, the word disability here in America is used a lot. And I could understand how within the community, it can have like a negative connotation because it's like disabling. But I kind of feel like maybe we here in America have taken the word and giving it a different meaning to it. Because mm -hmm. I know there's abilities. I meet a lot of other individuals who don't like to use that term. And for me, I'm like, well, I, it's kind of like the language that's already spoken and I just don't see it as a negative. Right. Kind of like blind abilities gives a positive to it. And yet, if I was to say sighted abilities, they might think, whoa, what are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And words are so powerful. And that's something I definitely don't take for granted. And as a comedian and a spoken word and poet and everything, I see the power in words and how one word can really change a person's feelings or one word can mean something completely different to somebody else. My first relationship was actually with another blind person. It was like love at first touch. <laughs> we literally ran into each other and uh, uh, we looked into each other's eyes and we locked our canes. <laughs> it was sweet. Like that time, love was truly blind. That time. Yeah. It was nice. 
So Definitely. when you're in college and going to your classes and stuff, what alternative techniques, what accessible devices did you utilize? Mostly I use my laptop and it has the different screen readers on there. I had JAWS, I had Zoom Text. Zoom Text I really don't use much because my vision is very bad. That The little partial vision that I had left in my left eye doesn't really work. I used to be able to use it for some PDF or some scan materials because there's a lot of professors that just don't don't get it and they'll use like articles from the 50s or 60s it's just photocopies and the screen readers aren't able to read those photocopies right there's definitely a lot of that that goes on even in higher education which i think it's surprising but it still happens so i use mostly my laptop with screen readers but i also had a braille note apex braille note that one's amazing i love that i have it with the braille refreshable braille yeah with the refreshable braille i love it i've been using that a lot more than my laptop lately. Now, you mentioned something that a lot of students have faced, college professors, teachers that just don't get it. Can you explain that? Yeah, there's a lot of professors that are inexperienced in working with students with disabilities, specifically with blind students. A lot of times, you know, depending on the subject, whether it's math or history, you know, professors still sometimes use the whiteboard and write on the board. And as a blind student, I usually go up to the professors before classes even start. I meet them in their office to let them know. But if I'm not able to do that, I find the services for students with disabilities on any campus that I'm at. And I speak with them first and register with them so that I can have that backup support to kind of put a little bit of pressure on the professors to be accommodating. Because if you don't have that, some professors, they forget. You'll go up to them and you'll tell them like, hey, you know, I need these type of accommodations. And they'll be like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then they'll just forget. So having a place on campus specifically for students with disabilities is really needed because it helps to kind of keep the professors in check a bit. <laughs> I don't know how better to say that, but to accommodate their students. And the most difficult one that I've experienced, especially in graduate school, it's just so much reading that a lot of the articles, even the online articles are photocopied chapters of textbooks from a long time ago that our screen readers aren't able to pick them up. And then it just takes so much longer to read a good 15 pages and you need to read it by the next day. It takes a long time. Yeah, a lot of those Xerox copies or something, you know, there's a, the binding and they kind of warp the words a little bit when it comes near the binding. I really like what you mentioned about using the Disability Services Office as a backup, which means that you have to advocate for yourself. And that is kind of a security blanket that it's there for the teachers that don't get it. Yeah, you definitely have to advocate for yourself. And I think it's needed too. like as any individual, you know, it helps you grow and it helps you become a little bit more empowered because when you're used to having people kind of help and do things for you, when you reach the college level, yeah, you have to take that on by yourself. You're not always going to have people that are willing. So you have to advocate and speak up for yourself to have these resources available to you. And even with the office, you know, sometimes they have so many students that you are able to fall through the cracks. And so if you don't go in there and, you know, remind them, hey, <laughs> just reminding you that I have a test coming up in a couple of weeks and I need to have a reader or I need to have this test turned into a different format, you really just have to take it on for yourself. And it makes you, I guess, develop more professionally and also as an individual, you know, it makes you more empowered. When did you start developing these advocacy skills? Was it back in elementary school? Yeah, definitely as a child, because I had to grow up pretty quickly having this syndrome. I was having surgery since I was seven, eight years old. So there are times when in elementary where it's time to go out to recess, right? And everyone's playing and I had to speak up for myself and tell the teachers that I, I can't go outside right now. Is it all right if I stay in? Things like that, that I guess you wouldn't think a child so young would speak up, but I had to. I had to because nobody knew what was really going on with me if I wouldn't speak up and explain to them my situation. What services did you receive from your school district? Not much. <laughs> I was thankful to have a program called the Visually Impaired Program. They helped me to get 
a lot of large print material when I was in elementary through high school. It wasn't until I lost complete sight in my right eye due to a retinal detachment when I was 16 that I was taken out of school and I had home and hospital. And that's when I started to do mobility lessons with my cane. That's when I started to learn how to read and write in braille. And that was through the visually impaired program. I was very high functioning. So I was put into regular classes and then just had to be taken out for different consultations with these special instructors. And that all changed when you're 19, when your other eye detached, retina detached. Yeah. Yeah. That changed. And then I left like the regular school and I was having tutoring at home until I finally felt well enough to return. And when I did return, I finished my last two years of high school in this program called Middle College High School, which was a very new program at the time where they allowed high school students to take maybe two or three high school courses. And then the rest of the courses you would take were college courses. So by the time you would graduate high school, you already had college credits developed. Oh, that's interesting. It was an easy transfer when I graduated high school because I was already familiar with the community college and I was already taking classes there. So at what point, Laura, did you get a hold of your vocational rehab in the state of California? I started vocational rehab at 18. Prior to that, I didn't really get much help. I was in that weird area where my parents made too much money to get help but also not enough money to, you know, to really Mm. get everything that I needed. We didn't really have much help my whole, you know, growing up until I turned 18. And then that's when I started to look into, okay, I need to get vocational rehab. I need to do this and that. So I went out and signed myself up for everything. Unfortunately, that's when I realized like there were all these services I could have gotten before 18, but I was unaware of them. You just got to get on with getting on when you get on with it. (laughs) Yeah. Well, good for you. It's kind of hard being a blind person in today's society. I know a lot of people would think that it's probably not, you know, because all these new technological advances and everything, but it doesn't mean that they have been accessible. Let's take audiobooks, for example, right? Nobody gave a about audiobooks being accessible until able-bodied people realized that, oh, I can listen to this while I'm in my car. It looks like you succeeded in getting your certificate, your bachelor's degree, and you got your master's too. So I started the master's program in 2012. Originally, I was supposed to do a two-year program. I did the first year and it was fine, but I had health issues come up. That's when I endured that blood infection and I had a heart attack at Uh. that time. So I had to take a medical leave of absence and I was out for a while. I decided to go back to finish it. And again, I had another health issue arise. I had to take three medical leaves of absence. I don't know. I felt like there was some force trying to stop me from getting this degree. But I'm a bit stubborn. And so this last year, because you have a certain amount of years that you can complete the program with the work that you've already put in, anything after that, you'd have to start all over again. So I went last year to finally finish it because I'm, I'm very stubborn and I just, I was like, okay, I, I need to finish this. And then that's when I endured another retinal detachment in my left eye. I still didn't give up. I still kept going to classes, even though I was going through surgeries. I would go to classes with my eyes patched up because I had already been familiar with mobility and you know my screen reader and my braille note so I was like okay I still don't need my eyes it's fine I can get through these courses and I was passing my courses but unfortunately with this program you also have to do an internship and I guess my level of work that I was doing at this internship wasn't sufficient and I wasn't able to pass and if you don't pass your internship you don't pass the program it broke my spirit it broke my spirit because I felt a bit of discrimination because of my disability and I most always have the self-advocacy and the passion you know to speak up for myself but I had just been in such a place that I was very like kind of beaten down by everything that was happening one after the other that when they informed me of me not passing that was it and I decided to leave the program I didn't have the energy to fight it even though I knew that this was wrong I didn't have the energy and now that I've had some time to recuperate you know people tell me they're like well why don't you go back and fight it and try to get in 
And I just, I feel like that maybe all of this, there's been a reason why I just can't complete this program. And I think the reason is that I might have just kind of reached my end in the world of academia. Maybe this is time for me to focus more on the community, on comedy, and other things that really bring me joy besides just doing things that I feel like I have to do. Right after that, that's kind of when I started to really get into comedy because I was in such a place where I had my spirit broken. I was working hard and people still told me that it was not enough. And I was just kind of on this note of, okay, well, I don't want to do anything anymore unless it's something that really brings me joy because I was kind of killing myself in working so hard to get this degree and there was just so much hypocrisy and everything that was involved in it that I was like, no, I need to do something that brings me genuine happiness. And comedy was there for me for that. It was a good way to cope with my feelings at the time and to release some of that anger <laughs> that I had. And then now that I look back, I felt like it was, it was the best choice. It does get me from time to time because I did put in a lot of work a lot of work into that program and for me not to come out with this degree that shows that I am knowledgeable about all these practices and skills because then if I try to apply for a job that requires an MSW degree they're not going to believe me by just saying oh I did the work but I didn't get the degree they want to see the degree you know and you're a comedian. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. They probably wouldn't think I'm joking with that. <laughs> with all your work in school and stuff, you know, looking back, what would you say to a transition student today? What tips would you have for them? I would tell them that they should follow their heart. I know that sounds kind of cliche and cheesy, but there's a lot of intuition that I feel as individuals that we have. And sometimes we kind of mute that intuition because we want to follow this standard of what success is. You know, sometimes with vocational rehab, you have a set plan of what your educational goals are and what the goal is to eventually get off SSI and to get a job and to do that. And sometimes we get kind of sucked in and you kind of forget about the things that make you happy because you're just kind of on autopilot doing what you feel is needed. Although all those things are great if that's what really brings you joy and that's what you want to do. But that's not always the case for everybody. Success isn't always the same image for everybody. And that's what I learned. And I feel like if I could go back to tell myself to listen to my intuition, to listen to my heart, I might have saved myself a couple of years of mental torment of why I couldn't be enough. I would definitely give that as advice. Or even if you find that school isn't your thing, there's still so much to do in the world. There's so much that we're capable of doing. A lot of times, you know, we feel like we might not be capable because of outside voices, you know, and parents or teachers or anybody like who's trying to limit you of what you can do and that's not true. And I think this podcast is a great way of showing the versatility of how many blind individuals are doing what they're passionate about. I just want to thank you for coming on to Blind Abilities and sharing your story with us from Marfan Syndrome to your challenges being bullied in elementary school and rising above that and making your way into college and your degrees, your certificate, you know, and feeding the fire, as John Kay says. Yeah, I listened to that when you guys had John Kay on there, and that was so great, and he was so insightful. I really love that. I like his passion. So when you mentioned that not everyone's built to work the system and go through it, and then you finally found you know the spoken word the advocacy and the comedy so I'm glad you found those and makes you happy and that inner part of you comes out and that's where it seems to fit you know what I mean yeah and it's funny because sometimes like when you really pursue something that you're passionate about you'll start to realize that maybe you should have started doing this sooner because <laughs> like as soon as I started to do comedy I started to get like some recognition in the sense that people would hear my stand-up and be like wow like I never knew about that and you know because I like to spread awareness through my comedy I don't just like to do cheap laughs they're fine sometimes but that's what I fell in love with about comedy that you can send a message in a way where people might not even know that they're being taught 
a message. And I had a bit more recognition than all my years of doing schoolwork, which I thought was ironic. I was like, oh, okay. Here you got a <laughs> career as a stand-up comedian that most people would be like, well, what kind of money are you going to get out of that? But then again, I was trying to be a social worker and there's not much money in that area either. So <laughs> it's not really about the money. It's about your passion. And that's what feeds you. Oh, that's great that you found that. Laura Hernandez, thank you very much for coming on, and it's been great talking to you, and good luck with getting back up on stage there and break a leg, I guess. <laughs> or is that actors? <laughs> what do comedians break? <laughs> um, I don't know. They're souls, I guess. <laughs> break out people in laughter. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Laura, thank you very much. Okay, Jeff, thank you. This concludes Jeff's chat with Laura Hernandez. We'd like to thank Laura for taking time to chat with us, and we wish her all the best in her careers as a poet of the spoken word and as a comedian. Look for Laura's channel on YouTube. That's Laura Hernandez, L-A-U-R-A-H-E-R-N-A-N-D-E-S. As usual, we'd like to thank Chichao for his beautiful music. You can find Chichao on Twitter at El Chichao. Thanks so much for listening, and have a great day. For more podcasts with the blindness perspective, check us out on the web at www.blindabilities.com. We're on Twitter. We're on Facebook. And be sure to check out our free app in the Apple App Store and the Google Play Store.